Hey guys, it's Marie from Asian Boss. It's not every day you see celebrities speaking out on social issues. Today we are here to talk to Hamish Daud, one of the most famous TV stars in Indonesia with over 2 million followers on Instagram. He's also a huge ocean activist and has been dedicated to saving the oceans surrounding Indonesia. We got the chance to speak with him about how he became so famous and what he's been doing to save the ocean. Let's find out what he had to say. But first, make sure to hit the notification bell to be the first to watch any new Asian Boss videos. With that being said, let's get to it. Hi Hamish, thank you so much for chatting with Asian Boss today. Thank you for having me. So from what we understand is that you are one of the biggest TV celebrities in Indonesia and also an ocean advocate. Um, so you're obviously pretty well known in Indonesia already, but for our global audience, how would you introduce yourself? My name is Hamish Daud. I'm from Indonesia and um, I've been living in Jakarta, basing myself out of Jakarta for the past five years, working in the entertainment industry. And I consider myself an advocate for the Indonesian Ocean. So when you say you work in the Indonesian entertainment industry, what exactly is it that you do? Currently, well not currently because everything's been put on hold because of the pandemic, um, but I have a TV show. Um, uh, it's like a conservation, education, travel show on a network and it's called Indonesian Authentic Places where I go and discover villages and cultures and languages and food and art and ways of life that isn't known here, isn't taught in the curriculum in, in the schools. So I try to unearth and document it before it disappears. Look, there's 17,500 islands. You know, there's so much to discover and so much to understand that um, it's a shame if people don't know more about it. So that's where I step in. Uh, how did you get into that industry in the first place? How did you become a well-known TV celebrity in Indonesia? I had no intention on penetrating the entertainment industry ever in my life. Um, beforehand, I was working for 12 years as a design principal in an architecture firm. After 12 years, I had a bad accident. I had a bad accident um, that I was in recovery in rehab for about a year and a half. I had amnesia for nine months. I didn't remember anything. I, 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 I couldn't even leave my house because I couldn't come back because I wouldn't remember how to come back. And um, I forgot how to drive. My design studio, art gallery, went bankrupt, I was really um, in, a, in, a, in a tough um, position and I said to myself, I have a long bucket list, right? So I was like, if I ever get fit, I want to do the triathlon. If I ever get fit again and back to normal, I want to do a movie, I want to do this, I want to do that, blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, I have certain angels that are looking out for me and I, I was able to achieve um, most of what was on that bucket list. If you don't mind sharing what happened during that accident. Oh, I, um, nothing to be proud of. I, uh, I had a bad accident. I slipped off a house and I fell uh, head first um, off the second floor into the, the side of the pool. And so I, I, I cracked my face, I broke my neck, I, uh, I broke 11 bones um, and I uh, lost my vision and I had facial um, reconstruction with metal plates and I had a nose job, I had a, um, I had a, I, I hurt myself pretty bad on that one. So I had to, um, had to start from zero again, basically. You know, when you have amnesia, it's like, when you eat pizza, it was like the first time I ever ate pizza. You know, cause I never, it's like, I forgot what it was like. Um, like when I had to drive, I had to learn how to drive again. Like I've never driven. If I have to, you know, it's a funny thing, man. Like uh, the brain can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And it's, um, yeah, so it was uh, maybe God's way of um, telling me to get back on my feet and, um, you know, stop having a great time and start focusing, I guess. <laughs> right, that must have changed you for life. Oh, it changed me in a hundred ways and, it, uh, and I, I love it. A lot of people um, didn't believe that I would ever recover. A lot of people um, were 
not happy with how much I changed. I have a philosophy now where I just don't want to waste a single day, you know, because I, should be, I shouldn't be alive. When I had my amnesia, it was hard for me to, to string a sentence together. And um, one of my best friends, uh, his, his wife um, challenged me to do a movie, to do a short movie. I said yes, because that was part of my bucket list, right, when I was in hospital recovering. And it was a very, it was the very first time I was ever in front of camera, I remember, and I was so nervous and I had to remember the script, which I can't even remember a sentence of me talking sometimes, and I had to, I really challenged myself. I, I was just very grateful that someone still had faith in me. <laughs> Not long after, I uh, took on a big screen uh, production, and um, the movie, a lot of good actors in it that won um, some awards, uh, best performance of the year, Luke Mansardi won best performance, and, um, and then I kind of started to get a name uh, for myself. And not long after, a TV network came to me and said, uh, we would like to work together with you. Um, have you ever thought about hosting a TV show? And then I was like, never in my life. I don't even know what to say to it camera. <laughs> I said, how about we do a lifestyle um, of adventure and travel about what I do and how I perceive Indonesia. You know, I'll go spearfishing and catch my own food and cook it on the beach. I'll go surfing. I'll ride motorbikes all over the country and I'll interact with different cultures, languages, foods, religions, and I'll prove to people that you don't need money to travel and to have adventure and to see how beautiful Indonesia really is. So I did a pilot for that and we won it, we got it, and uh, there was a TV show called My Trip, My Adventure that um, became quite a big hit. That was the, the, the kickoff for my uh, TV host uh, career. It sounds very exciting. It sounds like you're a very adventurous person. When, when you say adventures, it's not like I, I, I jump out of trees and, and you know, I, I... But basically, that's what gets the ratings up whenever I put myself in a, in a, a dangerous situation. But I'm like, I'm like to the network, you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 years old and I have a family now. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do too many crazy things, but just being able to be honest uh, with myself, with TV stuff like... Um, free diving. I love to free dive and spearfish and surf and motorcycle. So it's, uh, I guess, you know, that's one thing that I learned with the entertainment industry is just to be honest and be who you are. Don't try to be somebody you're not. It'll just excel so much quicker than if you were trying to be another person. You know, people want to know you for who you are. So that's what that's what I learned anyway. So the fact that you are doing all of that motorbiking and all these action activi activities for shows means you completely recovered from your accident or is there anything still that like hinders you? Yeah, I have a few injuries left. Um, I guess with things that I do normally, like free diving or spear fishing or surfing, I guess people would say that's dangerous, but that's sort of, that's normal, I guess, for my lifestyle. So it's, um, it works out. You just mentioned all these activities in the ocean, like um, spear diving and everything. So let's take it back to where it all started from. How would you describe your upbringing? My upbringing was very colorful. Um, I had love around me. I always had a roof over my head. Um, actually, I'm half Australian and I'm half Indonesian. I, um, after being born in Australia, um, came back to Bali and uh, lived there for a few years with my mother and father until they broke up and um, I moved to Jakarta for a couple of years and I learned to speak English in Jakarta actually and, uh, and then I moved to Sumba. Sumba is an island in uh, eastern Indonesia and it's um, the least most populated island in Indonesia per square meter so it's about four times bigger than Bali there were no stores, there's no deliveries, there's no supermarkets back then where I was living. And so if I was hungry, I had to go and catch my food. I had to go and pick my food. I had to go and look for my food. So I learned to live off the earth and the ocean for about five years. And, uh, 
until my mother found out that I wasn't going to school and I was living as a jungle boy. Honestly, that was some of the best times of my life. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd go horseback riding and sleep in the forest for three days. I'd go and catch fish and, and barbecue on the beach and sleep on the beach by myself. And I'd, I'd be friends with the village kids and we'd go exploring. And, and it was just, I learned more in those few years than I ever have in other institutions, you know. And it was, um, spent time with whales, with manta rays, with sharks, you know, free diving for lobsters and, and uh, picking abalone off the, the reefs of low tide, figuring out what I can eat and what I cannot eat. And it doesn't make me a special person because this is how Indonesian people have been living for thousands of years as a maritime experience, as a maritime uh, country. This is how everyone lived for thousands of years. So I'm, you know, I'm just trying to reconnect people to that frequency again and make them understand um, how important the ocean is. Right, so that sounds like you could pretty much survive in the jungles, could you? Today, if we put you in a jungle right now, could you survive? <laughs> oh man, I would find any excuse to live back in the jungle. I, 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 I love being out there. Um, and you know, it's, it's so fascinating to, to understand different cultures and how they survive. And, botanists, how they can just pick different leaves and mix it together and it can become, become medicine or it can become poison or it can become therapeutical uh, um, substances or foods and it's just so much knowledge um, in sort of uh, rural areas and villages. Have you been into saving oceans even prior before you became famous? I've always been concerned because I've seen the change from when I was a little kid, teenager, adult, and I just saw what happened um, hands-on, uh, the, the difference within 30 years, you know? And I just, um, I try to tell people and to tell people not to litter or to, not eat sharks, and, but it didn't make sense. I, I, I was just this preaching, annoying kid, you know, and um, I didn't really understand the global scale on how to um, express my thoughts. I had so many things that I wanted to do, but I just didn't know how to execute it. You know, before I, um, when I just started getting into entertainment, um, I asked uh, who my manager, who's my manager now? I asked her, like, how do I get a voice? You know, I'm not, she's like, well, you're not a marine biologist, you're not a scientist, like, you know, no one really is gonna listen to a mixed kid from Bali who's a surfer, <laughs> who's preaching about the ocean, you're gonna be like, an annoying person in society. So, um, you know, back to entertaining, uh, back to entertainment, um, I had to sort of get, get a name for myself. And, um, and yeah, look, to answer your question, I've always wanted to share what I know and what I understand about the Indonesian Ocean. Um, so when you say you're an ocean advocate, what does that mean exactly? Like, what do you do as an ocean advocate? I have a marine conservation NGO and uh, it's called Indonesian Ocean Pride. And it's been legally an NGO as of a year now. And um, in a nutshell, I'm not a marine biologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a high level academic. I'm just somebody that cares. So what I did was I just handpicked friends from all over the globe. I chose the best professors, um, uh, high-ranked people in, um, in parliament, uh, scientists, activists, people with the same frequency of passion. And I put together a team and formed it as Indonesian Ocean Pride. And my goal is, it's a simple goal, but it's not so easy. My goal is to reconnect Indonesian people back to the ocean. Now, we're a maritime country. It's the biggest marine archipelago in the world. 
people have forgotten about that. People have uh, detached themselves from this history and um, there's been a pivotal change in our culture that people have forgotten about our roots as ocean people, you know? So I'm trying to reconnect people with education, with campaigns, with programs, with reassessment of uh, blueprints for national parks, with conservation of species. And if it can do that, more people will love the ocean, respect the ocean, protect the oceans. The ocean devastation is a global thing. Like I said, 70% of the world is ocean. You know, we have glaciers in the Arctic that are melting, Great Barrier Reef that's depleting. You know, even the Galapagos Islands are under threat from illegal fishing vessels. And look, the list goes on and on. However, Indonesia is such a focal point because of how important the biodiversity is, you know, it's, there's so much going on here that it really is the last frontier of the world. An area that uh, my team and I we focus on a lot is uh, West Papua. The 75% of the world's coral species are there. It's the heart of the coral triangle. You know, there's 30% of the world's reef fish. There's so many endemic species to Indonesia. I mean, it's a migration alley for many species. Sharks have been living for 400 million years, which is two times older than dinosaurs. 400 million years ago, sharks were the apex predators in the ocean. Now, in the last 25 years, we've depleted 90% of shark species on Earth. These guys are on our planet for 400 million years, and you know, due to consumerism and humans, which make up 0.01% of, uh, of, of life on Earth, we've wiped out 90% of the shark population. I mean, this is the apex predators. These are the, the top of the food chain in the ocean. These are species that, that stabilize the whole ecosystem of the sea. What do you think is the biggest issue that the oceans are facing right now? Like, why did the oceans become like this? It's, it's suffered a lot from not only pollution, but overfishing and irresponsible techniques. And um, now we're talking about at a global scale of, of climate change and the bleaching of reefs. There's been a big problem with plastics. Uh, in the last 30 years, 20, 30 years, there's been such an increase in plastic products from drinking water to straws, single-use plastics. How does the plastic get into the water and why does it get there in the first place? Because there must be some sort of regulations, right? Um, unfortunately, there is no regulation. You know, there's no fines for throwing rubbish on the streets. Now they're starting to apply uh, fines. So basically about 70%, 80% of the rubbish that is found in the ocean is from the land. So someone might be drinking in the car, throw the bottle out the window, that bottle um, finds its way to the gutter, it rains, gutter goes to the river, river goes to the ocean, and that's how we have the problem of the waste problem in the ocean. And uh, you know, there were many uh, statements from international um, NGOs saying that we have the number two dirtiest water ocean in the world. It put a lot of pressure on us to, to really find a solution. Plastic is produced and made in a way where it's supposed to last forever. You know, it's not something that is biodegradable. Um, it's something that is supposed, uh, was made to increase uh, uh, commerce and consumerism, right? So it's, it's, it's something to increase the, the, the economy of certain areas from commerce in, in, in supermarkets and shops and, 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 and stores. And, and um, I think it really increased here in Indonesia over the last 20, 30 years because of hygiene. You know, people don't want to drink from a glass, they want to drink from a straw to avoid bacteria in the small stalls. People want to drink 
uh, the bottle, small bottle, because it's convenient and it's clean, rather than having a glass, you don't know where you're getting it from, and you know, so it's a lot of factors why plastic grew so quickly. There's a saying, um, when, you know, with the demand, there's always going to be supply. So there's a saying like, when the buying stops, the killing stops. We are the biggest archipelago in the world. It's almost impossible to patrol every single island. For generations, we haven't been able to control the illegal fishing vessels coming from other countries. You know, we've had estimations of $20 billion a year loss in illegal fishing from people stealing our fish every single year. How do you define illegal fishing and legal fishing? Okay, so illegal fishing is usually vessels that are flagged internationally. They're not Indonesian boats. Uh, fish from, uh, fishing vessels from other parts of the world, Asia, and, and, and oh, it goes on all the way up to, to, to European vessels. I mean, illegal meaning like it's not a flagged Indonesian vessel. This is um, people from outside coming into our waters and, and fishing without um, the, the, the right protocol or, or, or licenses. Um, you know, they might be after uh, tuna. Uh, for those that don't know, tuna is their main catch, but everything else they catch on the side is a bycatch. So it, that's just a bonus, you know? Do they kill the rest as well then or free them again? Unfortunately, in the industry of illegal fishing, um, there's no catch and release um, uh, rules that are abide by. <laughs> um, everything is a bonus. So, especially now with the depleting numbers of fish, um, everything is just a bonus. So, they really just debaucher and just catch whatever they can. Uh, and so, how is overfishing related to ocean pollution or um how does overfishing damage the ocean? Well, when you're wiping out that many fish all in one go, you're ruining the marine food chain and the ecosystem underneath the sea. So, you know, if you take out the top apex predators like the sharks, um, that destabilizes everything in the ocean. It's, it's hard to naturally maintain its, its uh, marine ecosystem um, if, if, if fish are depleted at that, at that level. Um, it also uh, ruins the livelihoods of most of the country because you know, we are so dependent on, 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 on marine life for food. There's been a lot of focus with um, government bodies, um, the fisheries department, the maritime uh, department, the forestry and health department in patrolling our ocean, but it's very difficult to patrol every single island. Everybody's doing a very good job, at, you know, trying their best to, to, to stop it. Now, with the help of technology and satellite um, um, cameras, governments are really um, hands-on trying to help this problem. So, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy. I don't want to say I'm fulfilled yet, but I'm very happy about the commitment that officials are putting in to help conserve our ocean. How much do you think does tourism contribute to this problem because Bali is obviously known as a very popular tourist attraction to a lot of foreigners. Look, I think it's inevitable that any amazing place is going to grow. I think that um, many parts of Bali wasn't quite ready for how quick of a change was about to happen. I think the people weren't ready for certain things like waste management, um, certain things like traffic, like city planning, um, uh, sort of council regulations to control the amount of hotel rooms that were being um, uh, built. Well, actually, I've been, I've been snorkeling with whale sharks in the Philippines one time. Uh, in Cebu, there is these like, huge Cebu. whale sharks yeah, in Oslop. And obviously whales, those whale sharks were used for as a tourist attraction. And I just wanted to get your opinion on that. If you think that's ethical or is it okay if it's handled with regulations? Um, look, uh, diving tourism is, is 
huge um, industry. It's um, it's growing um, now. Whale sharks is um, you know it's it's an attraction. You know, it's the biggest fish in the sea. Whale sharks are majestic. You know, they're yeah. they they have such a docile, cute energy about them. You know, they have bad vision, so they almost bump into you. Um, <laughs> with all uh, tour guides, with live on boards, you know, there needs to be regulations on how to really look after the ocean. I mean, there needs to be. I'm not here to make rules or regulations, but I mean. You know they have to watch over the inexperienced divers or snorkelers. Keep your distance. Don't touch anything. Do not step on the coral reefs because that one step on the coral reefs might take 30, 100 years to recover. Maybe tour guides can have a some sort of certification that um, not just encourage tourism to know more, but yeah, yeah, to, to educate. I think the, they can play a really powerful role in educating and make tourism, make tourists really embrace that as a lifetime experience, you know? Not just, oh, I went and I swam with whale sharks and I touched it and it was great. But maybe if they knew that, you know, it is the biggest fish in the ocean, that, um, you know, there's certain facts that, that they can take away from that, they can make their trip even more monumental. I think. Um, tour guides can play a really vital role here in uh, the preservation of the ocean and um, giving people a better experience as well. So is there maybe something foreigners should keep in mind when they visit Bali? What would you want to tell tourists who come to Bali? Wherever you travel to, um, by all means, do some research of the place um, first, whether it's Bali or West Papua, um, but also keep in mind that um, you know, these are all islands and you're going to be involved in nature and indigenous people and local people and heritages and cultures. So by all means, act the way you would act if it was your own home. You know, be civilized, be polite, give back. Don't um, have an attitude of take, take, take or um, us and them. It's kind of like um, you're coming into our home. So please uh, just be polite and be a good guest. Right. So what do you think would happen if nobody did anything about saving the oceans? If we, let's say, um, if we just let things be the way they are and just don't do anything, how would the oceans look like in, let's say, 30 years from now? 30 years from now, if nobody cared about the ocean, <clears throat> yeah, you'll see that about 90% of species will be depleted. Uh, we'll see no more coral reefs. 70% um, of the world, the globe, 70% is ocean. Now, there's more oxygen created from the ocean than all the trees in the world. You know, there's, there's a certain photos photo, um, photosynthetic um, process from plankton and single cell organisms that produces oxygen, healthy coral reefs, plankton, you know, these are all very vital parts of how we survive day to day, you know. It, most of the breath that you're taking now during this conversation is from the ocean. It's something that we have to really look at the long term, you know. A lot of people don't believe in climate change, but the reality is the fact and figures are there. Um, a lot of people don't understand how they can, how the fact that the ocean can produce so much oxygen, but that's the fact, you know. Um, at the end of the day, if we're going to let it be, um, this is going to, you know, destroy mankind. This is, this is the reality of what's going to happen for, you know, the next uh, few generations uh, to come. Uh, so, it's a bit unfair how, you know, our generation and the previous couple of generations have, have been so involved in consumerism and industrialism that um, we haven't really thought about our kids or grandkids. You know, we put them under a lot of pressure to um, fix up our problems. Not a large number of people experience firsthand, just like you, um, how to take care of the ocean. And you just live, you lived close by when you were a kid and not everybody has that experience. Why should people who don't live close to an ocean even care? 
because some critics could say, oh, whatever, it doesn't even affect me, right? It's not my problem. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And um, I get asked that all the time. You know, a lot of people don't have access to the sea. But, you know, something that people really need to understand that it's not about you, it's not about me. You know, this is a time where we need to come together and collaborate globally. One person, one person isn't gonna go and clean all the rubbish in the ocean, right? But if we all take time out and help clean up the sea, um, we don't litter, if we all, as a global community, do our part to help out, that will be such an incredible help to the current situation that we're facing. Um, you know, it's the same thing with the current pandemic uh, situation. You know, one person isn't going to uh, cure this pandemic, but if we all get together, if we all um, act as a community to watch over each other, to abide by protocols, to wear masks, to, we, can, we can all get through this together and help the numbers and decrease the numbers of infected people. So I think. I think the, the, the idea of a global collaboration really takes part here and I think it's very relevant to not just the pandemic but also with the world of conservation. The one amazing thing about Indonesia is that Indonesian people are so proud. You know, it's uh, very patriotic, very proud, very, very, very beautiful emotion about how proud Indonesia is, you know, um, describing their heritage and where they're from and trying to explain uh, to people from outside um, who they are and what they stand for. And, and people do care about the environment, but people just don't know. You know, people aren't taught, people aren't educated. So this is why my NGO is a platform of education to really open up people's eyes to making them understand more about the marine world and this maritime culture that everyone is from. A lot of uh, middle-aged people don't know that their bottle is going to end up in the ocean when they litter it in the middle of the city. Um, people don't know th that you know every time they use a straw, it's going to take 150 years to to break up into microplastics that's going to end up in our in our food chain at the end of the day. People don't know these things. It's not that they go out waking up one day and go, you know what I'm gonna do today? I'm gonna throw this bottle out of the car and you know what, I'm a rebel. <laughs> Indonesian people aren't like that. Indonesian people, we love to care about other people, especially our country, you know? So I feel like, um, yeah, people just don't quite understand or it just comes back down to how important education plays a role during these times. How do you think you can educate people? In my mind, it's almost like we should attach a GoPro to that plastic bottle uh, and then see what happens once you throw it out and then just follow the path and how it lands in the water. Um, but obviously we can't do that. How do you think you can educate people, like a large number of people, so they get educated on it? Wait, wait, give me a minute. Let me just call Nadim, the Minister of Education. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 don't ask me how to educate people, um, ask the, the higher-ups. I guess the, the curriculum in our country hasn't changed very much in the last two generations. Um, thankfully, one of my friends is the Minister of Education at the moment, so he has um, a lot of good ideas, a lot of um, high hopes, we all have a lot of high hopes um, for um, appropriate and realistic changes to our education system. But for me, I guess just put on a mask and go for a swim and take a look at how beautiful or how damaged or um, how fascinating or how mysterious or how wonderful the Indonesian Ocean really is. You, are, you sound really passionate about the ocean. I actually want to just go and snorkel right now. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. So what sort of action have you taken to address this problem? 
you've mentioned your NGO before, so when and how did you start your NGO? Was, um, I was actually on an expedition trip um, in West Papua about um, six, seven years ago with leading professors and scientists and activists and really amazing people. One of my um, partners has discovered and given the Latin names to over 1,500 species, new species that he's put together, found, documented, and, and put in the, um, the glossary books of Indonesian fish, you know, and there's other activists that have won Sundance Festival, Emmy Awards, um, sticking up for the Indonesian Ocean, there's people that's made um, the manta rays a protected species, and th th there's just so many wonderful people on the boat, and, and I was like, why doesn't anybody know what you guys are doing, you know? And w w w this is something that you guys need to share with the Indonesian people. There needs to be a movement to understand the frequency of where you guys are at. And, um, you know, like I said, I'm not a, an academic or a scientist, but because I've had so much ocean time, I was able to connect with everybody and we, I was invited on this expedition for um, collecting data for uh, leatherback turtles, manta rays, and whale sharks at the time. That was the day that this movement called Indonesian Ocean Pride uh, was born. And it was connecting the Indonesian people back to the ocean with the emotion of pride, like I had spoken about earlier. Indonesian people are so proud. But if I can ha somehow make them proud of the ocean by educating them about that, and the history and the culture and the heritage, basically when you love something, you become proud of something. You become proud of it. And when you're proud of something, big chance is you're going to protect it. You, I mean, we, we're humans. We protect what we love. So that's why we call it Indonesian Ocean Pride. So that's, um, that's one interesting project. And um, one that's... Uh, a main focus for me at the moment is an octopus that my friends and I had started. Sorry, it's a, it's a new startup called Octopus that my friends and I have started. It's, a, it's an app, it's a startup. We have about mm, 16,000 people using our application. If you have 10 bottles of plastic in your house, in your rubbish bin, and you open up your app, all my um, Pomolongs, our, our, our waste collectors, will pop up on your smartphone. And all you have to do is click to the closest one and they'll come to your house. The face will pop up of uh, who's going to come to your house. It's all registered. Uh, uh, a a well-presented um, man or woman will come to the house in uniform and uh, will pick up the rubbish and uh, take it to our recycling facilities. Even the users get benefits. Uh, we have e-payment systems where you can actually uh, use vouchers to go and eat for free. You can go and get free coffees. We're working towards e-payment systems where you can have free phone credit. Our, our waste collectors are no longer in dirty shirts, in dirty clothes, homeless. Um, our waste collectors are all in uniform. They have smartphones. I'm working out a system where they have motorcycles with um, being able to, to pick up more plastics. Um, I'm working out a system to have accommodation for them. I have insurance for them. I have scholarships for their kids. And they are accepted into society. It was called scavengers, right? But we took the S and C out. So these guys are Avengers. These guys are like the superheroes. I can't advertise that because, you know, I might get in trouble with Marvel, um, with Marvel Comics. But, um, you know, I really find that our pomolungs, our waste collectors, are the real heroes here. And for too many years, for a couple of generations, they weren't really accepted very well. You know, I saw too many people sleeping on the street streets, old women carrying big bags of rubbish. Um, I just found that there was just a lack of humanitarian care for, for in my opinion, are the real superheroes. And I just, um, I really wanted to make this uh, not just a, um, a, a waste collection 
solution, but I really wanted to make this a humanitarian movement um, because they deserve more than what they're getting. Let's say I have five bottles of, pl like five plastic bottles with me right now. I go to the app, I open it and I say, hey, I have five plastic bottles and then somebody comes to my door and picks it up. That's how it works. Just click on some of my guys, they'll come and pick it up and um, they'll uh, accumulate it and they'll take um, their amount of plastic collected waste and take it to our collection centers to be chopped up and taken to our recycling facilities to be made into new products. That is so smart. You just solve so many problems at the same time with this startup. The last six months during this pandemic, I've been staying up till four o'clock in the morning, figuring out all different holes and angles um, on how to really um, strengthen this startup. And uh, we have um, a lot of attention now from government officials because you can do a beach cleanup, gather all the plastic bottles and straws, and then what? The next day it's gonna be dirty again. So um, it needs to be at a national level, um, at a level where it's not just an organization cleaning up the beach, it's thousands of people cleaning up the beach and there's a bonus for everybody for helping out. As a startup ourselves, we can really relate on um, like your hard work and trying to solve a big issue, right? In Germany, we have something similar where every plastic bottle, um, when you collect it and there's a little recycling sign on it, it says uh, you, can, you can bring it to one of the supermarkets, they collect it and you get 25 cents per bottle. And there are homeless people who collect all these bottles because why would you throw away money? And even like ordinary people are incentivized to actually recycle and not just like throw their plastic bottle out of the window. So this is a fantastic idea. So how do you actually fund this? At the moment, it's all out of our pockets. It's, it was just like now or never, you know, we can talk about it. Um, so there's been, um, it's all been internal. Um, there's been uh, quite a lot of attention. Um, so fingers crossed, um, I think uh, we'll be able to uh, hopefully maintain the future of Octopus and this uh, startup for the next however long it takes to clean up our country. But I'm sure since you're an entertainer and you pretty much built your own career already, you have a very stable foot in life already. So technically you could just lay back and just chill out and don't care about anything else, just live a comfortable life. What motivates you to keep on fighting for your cause? If life was that glamorous and that easy, um, I would have done it from a long time ago, but I'm also somebody that can't sit still. I have a very curious personality where I have to learn something new every day. You know, um, I didn't choose the academic route, you know, I have my degrees and diplomas, but I try to gain a skill or learn something new every single day, you know, and I feel like that's helped me a lot, having that um, sort of philosophy to live by. And I remember in front of my house in Sumba fishing for food that day with my father and seeing whales and killer whales and, you know, surfing with manta rays and sharks and, you know, picking off lobsters and, and certain shellfishes and, and, you know, that's how I remember the ocean as a kid, you know, and um, it's just not the same anymore. Honestly, like a motivation for me is I just want to be able to share with my daughter like what, how, what I know, how I seen, how I grew up. I wanted to name my daughter uh, Zali, which means uh, strength from the sea. And then my, my wife uh, wanted Eilina, which is uh, soft and delicate and beautiful. And um, because we always sort of clash with ideas, we had to meet in the middle. And so we mixed the two names and my, my daughter's name is Zalina. So a bit of both. It would be unfair to be part of a generation that ruined everything for my kid and our kids. You know, I just feel like, um, you know, I'm in a position now with the help of entertainment, with being able to increase my volume in the public. Um, I'm in a position now where I can put it to good use and not just talk about me.
I'm here to talk about um, our surroundings, our environment, our ocean, which is not just important for Indonesia, but it's important for the world. And um, how can you not embrace something that important, you know, and, and who we are as ocean people, you know, and uh, I know it sounds idealistic, it sounds fairy tale-y, but it's not. It's very science, it's very up-to-date, it's very current, it's very relevant. And um, yeah, I think I'm just going to keep trying my best to make sure that my kid, my daughter, can um, experience the ocean the way I did. What do you think is the biggest difficulty in building a movement? Have you ever felt like wanting to give up on your mission? Look, with any new idea, it takes time, especially in a developing country. Um, people want to see you fail. People want to criticize you. Um, seniors want to watch for you to make a mistake. Um, it's, but once it starts moving, um, people are quite quick to join. Uh, and um, I think persistence is probably the most difficult thing. There's, there's many times where I just wanted to give up. I felt like many times I was like this preacher guy by myself telling people what's right and wrong and who am I, you know what I mean? Like um, I kind of, um, I lost faith uh, in myself. There were many times where, uh, you know, it was draining from my pocket, my, my, my finances, especially after I had a child. I couldn't um, take out uh, certain funding that was, should be for my family, you know. Um, so that's why I made it an official NGO and um, started sort of uh, fighting towards grants because it just became a bit too heavy for me after five years. Um, it, it hasn't been easy, but um, you know, when ideas are accepted, when people come together, and now it seems like there's been a bit, a bit of excitement coming through with some ideas, and it's very rewarding. It's a very re rewarding feeling um, because uh, yeah, you know, the hard work is paying off. So I'm sure that there's a plenty of people out there who find this as important as you to save the oceans. A lot of people might not really know how they can help as a person, as an individual. How can an ordinary person can take action? I'm not going to be able to change people that were so used to littering or... I can't police everybody. The last thing people want to hear here is me preaching, don't litter, don't do this, don't do that. They have a hard life here as it is, you know. Most um, people here have hard lives where they're trying to take care of their two kids, their in-law that's not feeling well, paying off their house. The last thing they want is a mixed uh, man like me, a mixed race man like me telling them, don't litter and don't do this. But you know what? That's okay. It's about your individuality. It's about you and, and what you find uh, is calling you with your heart. You know what I mean? Like, I can't tell you, go and help save sharks. Go and um, help uh, beach cleanups. Um, just figure out what it is that suits you the most, you know, and, and um, join in. Um, join an NGO. Join, join a group that, that is uh, putting their, their, their sweat and blood into uh, helping out. So, look, the more people understanding, the more people getting involved, um, the more helpful it is. That's very beautiful. So lastly, is there anything you would want to tell the young people who might be watching this video right now? Don't do drugs. No, no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I mean, kids um, have to figure it out for themselves, you know. Um, just listen to your heart, be honest. It's a very different time for kids, you know. We live in an information age where kids have information so much quicker than when I was a kid. Figure out what it is that you, that you truly love. You don't have to impress anybody. You don't have to try to get likes or, um, I don't know, um, shallow acceptance on social medias and stuff like that. Just figure out what it is that you like to do because at the end of the day, you know, you're born alone, you die alone. So you have to figure that out for yourself and um, figure out what your passion is and, um, and go for it. The worst thing that people can say to you is no. So as long as you just give it all, give it your all, just try and um, forget about what people say, man. If it comes from here, then 
if you fail, you fail. At least you tried. You know, if people say it's not going to work out, they said no. Okay, move on to the next project. But you know, don't live your life through someone else. Okay, cool. Yeah, I hope this in this interview gives a lot of people inspiration to find their passion, just like you did. I mean, look, I I love what you guys are doing, and I mean, if I can somehow be of influence to, to anybody, I mean, that's 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 a plus point for me, you know. Um, it's 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 a good feeling when when someone takes when when I make someone's life effective and and they can pull something out of what I say. So it's 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 definitely cool. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for this chat today. Um, I wish you all the best for the future and hopefully you can achieve all your huge missions and your goals and hopefully we can even catch up again. So thank you so yeah. much. Thank you guys for your time and um, the relevant questions and uh, giving me a platform to sort of um, talk about what I'm up to. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>